This is the Seminole Wars Authority. Hello and welcome. In our previous episode, Jesse Marshall gave listeners an overview of newspaper coverage of the Seminole Wars, reviewing their accuracy given the physical and technical constraints of the era. In this episode, Jesse relates the value of the newspapers for informing the American public about what actions and activities their government engaged on their behalf in the Seminole Wars. He lays out a mixed bag. Some newspaper articles offered first-hand accounts of battle that hold up surprisingly well as part of the historical record. Others conveyed the gist of a battle, but were wildly inaccurate about casualty details. Jesse explains how historians collate such reports, often using reprints from the congressional record, to attempt to arrive at an accurate assessment of what happened in a given war encounter. In addition, printer capabilities improved to run woodcut illustrations, thereby presenting images, some accurate, some fanciful, about the war to the reader. Jesse Marshall, welcome back to the Seminole Wars Authority. Glad to be back. Last time, you gave our listeners a review of the three Seminole Wars as chronicled in various newspapers in the United States. Overall, what's the value newspapers bring to our understanding of the war? The advantage of the newspapers is that they would produce firsthand documents. In other words, the strong suit of period newspapers is where they reproduce the congressional debates, where they actually produce the specific reports of the president, the annual reports of the Secretary of the Navy, etc. The official reports of military operations are quite frequently placed in the newsprint because an Army officer's official report is a public government document. So you will find the report of Colonel Taylor at Okeechobee. His report goes into almost every newspaper in the country, which is one reason why many of the Missourians that didn't like that report then had to do their best to try to get their cause to reach a national level to where it could it could be in the national papers. It, it never got quite there. It was limited to the Missouri newspapers. Having read some colonial American newspapers, there really is not a great deal of difference in, say, 1770s, pre-1775 American newspapers. The newspaper's scale would be less. The American papers are larger, have more ink in them for your dime. So $2 a year, it says here, for the New York Weekly Tribune in 1842. Uh, so <clears throat> you're going to get 52 issues for two bucks. I would hazard that considering the nature of our constitutional republic and the freedom of the press, which was not to be abridged, the press considered it a right to produce the firsthand documentation that came from the government. But one of the distinctions is that at this time, the if you want to call it the bureaucracy of the federal government, was not particularly large. We see that the U.S. Army itself can barely muster 5,000 men, and the report of the commanding general of the Army at that time, when it was given annually, would be the equivalent today of brigade commander. The U.S. military today is of such a scale, you couldn't report even the Army alone's reports in the newspapers. It would require several volumes of annual data. There was the fact at the time that the federal government was so small that these newspapers have plenty of space to report on all kinds of local and other issues besides the federal news of the previous news cycle or the previous 24, 48 hours, etc. When you look at the 1830s newspapers, especially the national ones where they reproduce the actual debates on the floor of Congress and the Senate, so that it's not just a matter of reading the legislation that might be passed or the bills that are being debated, but you can actually read the uh, transcript of the debates you could actually see if your representative, perhaps someone you voted for or perhaps someone you voted against, but, but in any case, your representative, you could actually read in your local paper the statements of your representative on the floor of Congress and then make up your own mind if you wanted to support your, that representative in the next election. We have the case of David Crockett, who was elected in Tennessee to the House of Representatives. 
He opposed the Indian Removal Act, as it's called, of 1830, and in a brief and pithy notice on the floor, he gave vent to the opinion that while something might be done, he felt that the Indian Removal Act was certainly not the right mode of enacting it. He even made reference that uh, though he was quite convinced that probably not any or many of his constituents would agree with him personally on the point, the fact was that he was their representative and he was going to vote against it. Crockett subsequently lost his seat and went to Texas, which had declared itself a republic in 1836, where he was killed at the Alamo in March of that year. But the newspapers can be a mode by which your constituents as a representative can read about your doings. There was by the 1840s a, a understanding that sometimes your representatives might make statements on the floor of Congress, specifically knowing that they would be recorded and that they would then find their way into the print. Sometimes there was a word that I've seen referenced by some of the folksy humorists of the 1840s and 50s. They called it bunkum. In other words, a representative might feel the need to make statements on the floor that would appear in, in the newsprint to mollify any concern that their constituents had about their activities or voting record. Do, do you see what I mean? I've even seen reference by uh, contemporaries in the very contentious late 1850s that noticed one gentleman, in fact, I believe it was the son of Governor of Virginia, Henry Wise, who was a Southern fire eater, who was quite surprised on one occasion to find that the uh, Republican, Mr. Seward, to find himself in his company. While the newsprints made out Mr. Seward to the Southerners as hand in hand with everything bad about government, he was rather surprised to see these Southern gentlemen and politicians sitting around and shooting the bull with Mr. Seward in a social way and shaking hands and you know going about their days. I suppose that in that sense, when we see these references to bunkum, there was an understanding by some that just because you read your representative in the newsprint making a certain argument, you can feel assured that it at least made the argument on the floor and it was recorded, but it doesn't report of the other 23 and a half hours of the day where compromises are made and so forth and the processes of government are made. And we have by the 1850s, the prince reaching the point of the fire eating and actually the ban in some states preventing newspapers from... This is another thing that was kind of unique about America in a way. If you lived in New Orleans, you could get any newspaper in the country you wanted. So if you wanted, if you were in Florida in 1842 and you wanted the New York Weekly Tribune, if you paid them by subscription $2, they would mail it to you. Anyway, by the late 1850s, there were actual political bans on certain newspapers going into certain states claiming that they may or may not include dangerous ideas or things of that nature, particularly in the southern states where there was concern about avowedly abolitionist newsprints being distributed in the South by the late 1850s. About the newspapers themselves, these are the mode by which common people like ourselves would have derived their information about the Seminole War and about politics generally within their state and the federal government. So it was rare for anyone to subscribe to more than one newspaper. That seems to have been common. You would usually just read your hometown paper. If your town was big enough, there might be two papers at least, you know, one on either party spectrum. We scan the papers today and we're making a selection. Just the papers I scanned in the last, we're looking principally at Seminole Wars issues and so forth. But again, part of the point of these is to sell ad space. So every one of them is filled with all kinds of interesting notices, along with the reference to the end of the Seminole War and new social ideas of the organization of American governance. We have uh, more or less uh, the banal uh, boarding and day school uh, by Ms. Demarest is looking for students. Uh, Mr. Clyde uh, of New York with Ms. S. Augusta uh, has married. Uh, and on the 11th instant of Scarlet Fever, Mrs. Maria Elmira, daughter of Alexander M. L. and Margaret Scott, uh, has passed away at the age of two years and five months. 
et cetera. In fact, uh, there's uh, just in one of these papers a fascinating notice that coal as a source of home fueling was developing as a popular mode in lieu of wood in 1837-38 in New England. It notices that early English settlers liked coal, but in America there wasn't a source for it, but there's lots of wood, so wood was used as a primary fuel. But by the late 1830s in New England, where wood was not as uh, easily obtained, anthracite coal was being mined in larger and larger quantities to provide fuel in the home fires of Americans in New England, mentioning that they expected that the industry would continue to grow. So you can look at the newspapers and you can see the germ of ideas that may have expanded in the decade or century since. The idea that coal, for example, could be other than a, than a quaint curiosity among old-fashioned English immigrants, and now it, it actually has full-time people engaged in the industry of mining coal for fuel, which evidently before 1812 was practically unknown. Today, coal is an enormous industry and driver of interest. The ideas of social organization among the public through government is a widely accepted idea today. But again, we noticed in the very paper that mentions the end of the Second Seminole War, the idea of a social organization of the public was rather new. And so as that article mentioned, that space was evidently paid for. It was basically the equivalent of of an infomercial, a paid notice that appears like an article. But in fact, was, of course, advertising that book about social organization for the causes that it's promoting. And it's not hard to hide essentially an infomercial like that in these newsprints, because, again, there's no pictures and it's all just paragraphs and headings. And so you go to your local paper and you want something inserted. As long as it wasn't offensive, you pay them and they would insert it in that sense. Therein lies the rub. You assume when you're reading the paper that you're reading a lengthy, except for the first-hand documents or letters to the editor, you're assuming that you're pretty much reading the opinion of the editor of the paper because you don't really have what we understand today. You don't have articles with a headline by a particular journalist unless it's a letter to the editor, like a letter from a local man in the Florida war tells us on and then it'll have the letter. But otherwise, it's just text. And you're assuming that you're reading the opinion of the editor for the most part. So like this New York Tribune mentions Mr. Greeley, which uh, Horace Greeley, famous newspaper man, you're assuming that you're pretty much reading his opinion about everything as you're reading the compiled text. But I can tell you from doing computer searches of period newspapers, and today, of course, I'm looking at actual physical newspapers, But you can go online to the Library of Congress Chronicling America website, and you can search thousands and thousands of historic American newspapers from 1775 through the 1960s. You can do text searches on specific subjects, and you can search through certain years. One of the things that becomes notable when you do that, if you pick a year and you do a particular text search for something, you'll find that there's an enormous amount of duplication in the newspapers. In other words, they were desperate for content. And where one newspaper would print something, it would end up in another one. And there wasn't any concern about copywriting or pinching anyone's ideas because, again, there's actually no authors credited on most of the news notices unless it's an official report of government where it has the officer's name or the president's name or a letter from someone who, if they don't want their name shared publicly, they will give usually a pseudonym, like Publius. That's not odd. Even our Federalist papers from Hamilton, Jay, and Madison were published in New York initially under pseudonyms, although they later admitted to their authorships. You'll find a lot of the news relative to the war is not dissimilar from the local notices. For example, in the Army and Navy Chronicle particularly, which was essentially a newspaper for the military service, you find references to the changing of posts by different units. A notice similar to what you find in local papers about a farmer selling out and moving. You see in the Army Navy Chronicle, notice that, say, the 7th Infantry Regiment is now 
removing from Florida and heading to the Indian Territory, etc. There will be notices of orders for officers of the Army who were detached from their units so that the presumption is that if they didn't read any other newspaper, these officers on detached or staff duty, somebody might be receiving the Army Navy Chronicle. Obviously, they would have received written orders, but if anyone had any confusion about it, the officer corps of the Army generally and anyone else around a military post that read the Army Navy Chronicle would receive notice that, say, Lieutenant Smith now has orders to proceed to Fort Kent, Maine. If you had any business to attend to with him while he's at Tampa Bay, obviously you should attend to it because he's heading to Maine, according to the Army Navy Chronicle. The Army Navy Chronicle is uh, extraordinarily important for the Seminole War period. You're going to find in its pages not just the customary notices of the skirmishes and the battles, but a significant amount of internal letter writing to the editor from military officers who felt comfortable, obviously, to share their view about military operations in Florida without getting caught up into the political divisions relative to the Florida War that were developing by the election of 1840 between the Whigs and the Democrat Party. Chris Kimball has produced a volume, an index volume of the Army-Navy Chronicle in the period that breaks down by subject matter the contents of the Army Navy Chronicle in the period so that the researcher, instead of just blindly flipping through the uh, digital copies of the Army Navy Chronicle, which you can find some of them on Google Books, Kathy Trust, or other websites, Mr. Kimball's books is an interesting volume that uh, you can thumb through and look at a, a breakdown of the subject matter and be able to use it as reference to then find the notices in that particular military newspaper relative to the Seminole War. And because it is a military-based paper, it tells us a great deal about all kinds of things about the Army in that time. There are comical notices that the Army regulations must have been modified, at least for Florida, because everyone has a beard and that ranks are no longer going to be told by insignia but by how much hair you have on your face and uh, how ragged your trousers are and things of that nature, again, produced in comedy, partly in jest. We know from veterans of the war that the service here was of such a nature that even the officers could be rendered rather worse for wear rather quickly on operations here, leading to a certain degree of informality among the Army, which many officers noticed would have been shocking to the public. The public only saw the Army in seacoast garrisons or along the eastern seaboard, and when they did see them, it was usually on parade. And at that point, the soldiers would be wearing their full-dress uniforms, and they would be standing at attention, and they would be parading. And uh, otherwise, in the day-to-day operations of the fort, you would have guards mounted, but otherwise the men would be busy in their fatigue dress, cleaning things or digging holes or farming in many cases. They had gardens. In Florida, the troops had little use for dress uniforms. And so some of the officers mentioned that in letters to their family members that they would laugh to see the army in Florida, the officers themselves dressed like privates. For example, from General Clinch downwards at the Battle of Withlacoochee, it's wearing their, and, and in that case, wearing fatigue dress rather than uniforms. The newspapers on a local level, I want to note this too, it goes back to some of what I've commented on in the But when you look at the local newspapers from the different states, in many cases, during the Florida War and even during the Seminole War of 1818, a large proportion of the U.S. soldiers that served were not in the regular army. They were volunteer troops raised from the militia units of certain localities, or they might have been just the militia units themselves, just simply mustered into federal service. As a result, there isn't a lot of information on these units because They would literally only be U.S. units for several weeks, three months, generally. To get information on these units, you literally, on the military side, from the federal government, the only thing you'll really find is an order for an Army officer to muster them into service. And there you have it. There's the unit. It just instantly manifests. But to the researcher, you want to know about Major Mark Cooper's Battalion of Georgia Volunteers, It didn't just magically appear. It came from the militia around Macon, Georgia. And so you look at the Macon newspapers. 
And that's where you'll find notices from the governor that the different militia units need to prepare to provide either volunteers or prepare for a draft from among them to supply the number of men required by the president for the Florida campaign. In that case, five companies were acquired by volunteers. They didn't have to draft anyone. And that five companies was organized into Major Mark Cooper's Battalion of Georgia Volunteers. They are mustered into U.S. service, and they serve for three months in Florida. At the end of their three months, they're disbanded and discharged, and they return home. And, of course, they're reintegrated into their local militia unit. So it's by reading the local newspapers alone that you would find the details about the mode of organization, or lack thereof in some cases, of the local forces that were then brought into federal service for active duty in Florida. Because until they're actually mustered into federal service, there's no federal notice of these organizations as units. And so you have to read the local newspapers to find out the mode by which they were called together and placed in ranks in front of the mustering officer. There were cases where they didn't get enough volunteers from the militia of certain districts. And in that case, they had to make a draft. In other words, they would either draw lots or the officers would just pick men and Usually, obviously, it would be better to draw lots, and those men would be mustered into federal service with the volunteer units, in fact. And there were cases where in some districts, no one would volunteer, but if the district had been called upon to provide a quota or a levy, then they would just draft the number of men they needed. So you'll occasionally see in the muster rolls of the federal militia and volunteer corps that served in Florida... Sometimes you'll see a reference to so-and-so's company of Florida drafted militia. Well, that's just an indicator that it's not a militia unit mobilized entire, but that in fact it's a company that was organized from selected men that did not volunteer, but who had been drafted usually by drawing lots and then organized into a different company that was then mustered into federal service. You'll see when they're reporting a national news like that, they'll usually have a headline, you know, we see from the mobile register of the third Ultimo, right? So they will usually sort of accredit that they're drawing stuff out of another newspaper to fill space. So literally, to my mind, that means that when they're compositing, which is the process wherein all the tiny little metal newsprint blocks that have the letters that had to be arranged on the printing blocks to print each day's newspapers in quantity. And it obviously was very time consuming. And so they would often have young men or boys employed to compile these columns and paragraphs, and then they would set them in place for the printing press. I think it's pretty obvious that in many of those cases, the editor or owner of the paper would probably just uh, snip stuff out of another newspaper and hand it to a compositor and say, hey, I want you to reprint this. (laughs) That, to me, seems to explain a lot of the duplication that you'll find, whether it's from the duplication like coming from local papers, something that the national paper's editor thought should be inserted. The editor is the one that makes the decision about what's going to go in as far as content. The Congressional Globe seems to me from the last few times I've looked in it to be one of the heavier ones as far as reprinting an enormous amount of congressional debate on different subjects. If one wanted to subscribe to it, they could. Much like today, if one prefers, they could watch the floor through various TV channels of yore like uh, C-SPAN. And perhaps, uh, although I'm not familiar with it, perhaps on the Internet, there's a mode by which one could watch the floor of the House or the Senate generally. There's a decided lack of sensationalism in the period newspapers in the sense that, again, there's almost no illustration. The only illustrations usually are relative to advertisements. You might have in an advertisement a little carriage or something, and it says wagon wheels for sale. In the southern newspapers, sometimes you'll find a little image of a runaway slave. It'll have a stick with a satchel tied on the end, and it says, ran away from the subscriber, with a description of the absconding slave and then perhaps a notice of a reward. 
hat and caps. There's a little, a few little dandy illustrations of fancy men's bell-crowned hats and it says fashionable hats for sale on the corner of so-and-so. But for the news itself, there seemed to have been no particular concern through the early 1840s anyway of illustrating them. I want to say that there were some abolitionist newspapers in the 30s that were sort of pioneering in the use of illustration. It's just notable when you look at the common newspaper, the illustration just wasn't, they seem to spend a certain amount of effort in their, their headline at the top, New York Tribune or Boston Recorder, but that seemed to be about it. By the 1850s, however, late 1850s, that had really turned around. You had enormously popular newsprints like Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper and Harper's Weekly, which were fully illustrated. Sure, you could read the articles, but now you could just look at the pictures. And if it's true that a, an image speaks thousands of words, obviously the editors of those papers felt that having their special artists make drawings and then having their engravers rapidly engrave them so that they could be printed was considered analogous to replacing an enormous amount of text. I myself have enjoyed very much scrolling through the Harper's Weekly editions of the 1850s and 60s, partly because of the quaint nature of their illustration, but which, of course, at the time was rather radical and newfangled. If you look at it in a sense, it's not at all dissimilar from modern media with the imagery encoded into the news. When I was a kid, we used to watch the evening news, and it was illustrated. You look for that in the early republic, and you don't really see it until the 1850s in wide distribution. You open a Frank Leslie's Illustrated, and even if it's not a moving picture, you will see an image from their special correspondent on the ground at Harper's Ferry or at Gettysburg, which is not at all dissimilar from 1985, where here's to our special correspondent in Helsinki, right? And then the camera cuts to imagery from what's going on in Helsinki. But again, prior to 1845 and for most newspapers well after, you don't have imagery in them. It's all just newsprint. And I think that may turn the researcher off because it's not entertaining to read them. But if you just start reading them, you will be entertained because you could actually be able to compare people's ideas with the ideas as they were explained to them in their time, rather than merely applying to them our modern ideas. We have modern ideas about the political parties of 1840, but you can pick up a period newspaper or read them online, or, you know, read through them, and you get an idea of the manner in which they're holding themselves accountable in their time for the ideals that they held. There again, they're not criticizing themselves for their own ideas. They're criticizing where they think that Tyler has gone off the rails, for example. He's not holding to the line of President Harrison. So there's criticism of Tyler there. And of course, then maybe Tyler's opposition holds him accountable in other ways for these things. If you were to read from 1775 newspapers through the present day, I suppose that you would be able to see pretty clearly a chronological understanding how some ideas have reached a more general acceptance, how some ideas have been entirely abandoned, but how generally speaking, the newspapers themselves don't differ from modern ones, other than again, the use of more journalism as a practice of writership. Again, you don't see that in these papers. There's rarely the name of a journalist unless it's someone who's actually engaged in the activity that's being described. They didn't seem to just pay people to go down to Florida to wander around and ask questions and write, that they just waited for somebody who was in the Army to act as a correspondent for their paper and write them letters. So that's a pretty significant difference from the 20th century newsprints, I should say. There's no Ernie Pyle. Ernie Pyle in World War II was obviously paid. I don't remember which paper Ernie Pyle worked for or whether he was working through the Associated Press. His travels and labors were subsidized by his journalism. But in the Seminole War, journalism from the front lines had to come from the soldiers themselves writing their local papers. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of, uh, of relatively um, simplistic discussion 
there's there's an enormous amount of hearsay that gets caught up into it. So notices from Captain So and So of the steamboat watchman tells us there was a battle near Tampa Bay in which a hundred Indians were etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. He's referring to the Battle of Thanota Sassa Creek in April of eighteen thirty six. But in fact, even the officers that were at the Battle of Thanota Sassa Creek reported that they didn't find any seminal bodies after the action. They saw maybe some evidence of blood, but the idea that a hundred Seminoles had been killed was fantastical. In fact, some of the early reports from the opening of the war claim that General Clinch's army at the battle with Lacucci three days after Dade's battle. They claim that Indians have surrendered who claim 112 warriors have been killed in the action against General Clinch. And unfortunately, again, because of the nature of the newspapers sort of copying each other, these somewhat sensational statements then will be reproduced in other newspapers. It's only by actually searching for the particular incident that you may, for example, I've been searching for Battle of Thanota Sassa Creek references, and by collecting a couple dozen of them from period newspapers, I'm able to see that there were corrections made. The average reader who only reads one newspaper, they may get the impression from that rather sensational paragraph, and that newspaper may not even revisit the subject of that battle. So, yes, there is the obvious that the newspaper can communicate to you that there was a battle at the Nona Sassa Creek, but whether the details that it provides are accurate or not are, well, so far as I can say from my examination of period papers, it was for the most part inaccurate reporting about the incident. But that said, there were letters that then subsequently appeared in the press, particularly by one veteran of that battle who wrote a rather lengthy account of the action, which entirely counteracts most of the sensationalism, but that particular letter was only produced in the Tuscaloosa Flag of the Union in the summer of 1836, which was a local paper. And that article, being lengthy as it was, it did not find its way into the national papers. The national papers would prefer that small paragraph, large battle in Florida, 100 Seminoles killed. There wouldn't necessarily be any uh, retraction. Again, the correspondent usually is someone who's actually participating. Now, that could lead to some difficulties. For example, in the first campaign of the war, under major campaign under General Scott in the spring of 1836, some staff officers under General Gaines were writing letters to the editors back in New Orleans explaining the operations of General Gaines and, to a certain extent, some of the operations of General Scott. They were forwarding these letters by the steamboats that were bringing supplies into Black Creek on the St. John's or even Tampa Bay or at St. Augustine. And uh, during the court of inquiry into the operations of General Scott and Gaines, which was held at Frederick, Maryland, at the close of 1836, there's probably as much criticism of the officers of the Army meeting as correspondence to the press about the ongoing operations as there is criticism of Scott and Gaines as military commanders. George McCall comes in for a, a little bit of a drubbing about that because he had written several letters relative to General Gaines's operations and had made reference to General Scott in them. Scott at the inquiry wasn't going to miss a chance to strike back at some of the statements as to their accuracy. So there is actually in that, in the record of the court of inquiry between Gaines and Scott, the court martial, there actually is a lot of reference to notices in the press about the operations. There was evidently a regulation that officers shouldn't write letters relative to active operations or but what you'll notice is that Frequently, they won't put their name on the letter. Say, an officer in the Army tells us, or it'll say, an officer of the Army from our district tells us, something like that. They don't want to get their correspondence in trouble by giving their name. But evidently, Captain McCall was well known as someone that enjoyed writing letters to the editor in garrisons. And later, he was a Union Army general in the Civil War. And shortly after the war, he produced an interesting volume called Letters from the Frontiers which you can read on Google Books, and there are reprints available. A lot of that is a compilation of letters that he had written for the press, although you have to be careful with using the book, because what some authors have failed to notice is that in the introduction, he states that 
some of the letters that he reproduces are not actually period letters at all, but are in fact the product of his imagination or memory. In other words, he knows he wrote certain letters in a certain way 25, 30 years earlier, but he doesn't have the letter. So what he does is he reproduces it from memory. That's caused some confusion at certain points. For example, where he claims that was Ransom Clark, survivor of Dade's command, who'd been wounded several times, he claims in a letter relative to Dade's battle and uh, McCall's participation in the march of Gaines's army to the battlefield in early 1836, he claims that Clark was the survivor of the command that was present with Gaines on the battlefield when they buried the dead. That's not evidently the case because the records of the hospital at Tampa Bay show that the regimental records do show that Clark was hospitalized at Tampa through May of 1836. Also on March 13, 1836, which was while Gaines' army was yet on the march, a Louisiana militia officer at Tampa Bay interviewed Clark, uh, James Barr, and demonstrated that Clark was yet at Tampa Bay. So in 1868, when McCall writes his letter from the frontiers, and he gives it a headline as if it was a period letter, he says Clark was there at the battlefield with Gaines. He's going by memory. It would have been other survivors, perhaps Private Sprague. Another incident to that effect in McCall's work is when he describes in the late 1820s constructing the Fort King Road from Tampa Bay, which ran all the way up to Coleraine, Georgia, near the St. Mary's, eventually, the military road. He was part of the detachment of U.S. troops of the 4th Infantry that constructed much of the road, or blazed the trail anyway, and built bridges from Tampa Bay up toward the uh, St. John's anyway. He dates his letter, 1828, but a review of the regimental records of the 4th Infantry show that it was actually in 1825 that McCall and that detachment was employed constructing the road. I highly recommend McCall's Letters from the Frontiers as a veteran of all that he speaks of, but don't rely too much on his details because, again, some of those letters are actually, even though they are given in the format of a contemporary letter, they are, in fact, a memoir from 30 years later with some of the details um, slightly convoluted. And that's why I think the newspapers are important, because you can look in the period newspaper and it has a dated headline on it. So we know that this newspaper can only have news and ideas that are relative up to the date of its publication. It can't tell us what's going to be news tomorrow. It can't tell us what the news would be in 100 years beyond. And so the newspaper is of immense value as a, um, a contemporary notice. Again, a memoir can juxtapose decades of understanding, uh, whereas the newspaper, considering the whole process of managing one and marketing it and compiling it, but the newspaper is always a contemporary source, it may not be an accurate one about the details of historical incidents. But even where the news, the national newsprints might tell us bad details about the Battle of Sonora Sassa Creek, that is still historical because it tells us that the majority of the public understanding of the Battle of Sonora Sassa Creek would have been an error relative to it to the extent that they're reading this erroneous statement. Jesse, thanks for reviewing these newspapers and sharing what you've learned with our listeners. I want to thank you as well. The particular newspapers that I've been reading through today are part of a collection that belongs to the Seminole Wars Foundation and is a, a part of the archives and library of the foundation maintained in Bushnell, Florida. So that if anyone wants to look at an example of an early American newsprint from the period of the early 1800s, they can see one at the Seminole Wars Foundation library. One of the notable things is that mostly they're in very good condition. The paper of which they're printed on if not the highest quality, uh, not book quality, is uh, clearly of much better longevity in terms of its strength than, say, 20th century newspaper, which even when it's stored, the uh, chemical content of which tends to brown and embrittle over time. These period newspapers, even though the paper is weak and old, the paper is still pretty significant. You can see why a lot of people would try to save them as a record of their understanding of almost like their own diary, as it were, save the newspapers to 
in lieu of writing down your own diary because you know where you got the ideas. You can go look back at your stash of newspapers and see where the idea came from. When I was a curator for a small museum, we had several collections of newspaper scrapbooks from World War II that were kept by children and families. We had three or four of those. That's exactly what the people were doing when you flip through them. They were selectively editing portions of 1940s newspapers and clipping and pasting them into these books so that literally forming a journal of their own, but utilizing the text from the newspaper rather than producing their own. Because not being participants in the issues themselves, they're relying upon the journalists to inform them of what's going on. So we, as, as historians, we may prefer an actual diarist, someone that's actually on the ground. So as historians, we might prefer a diary. We prefer diaries, and we would definitely prefer a diary by somebody that's engaged in the incidents in which we're interested in studying. But we also recognize that the diarist is limited in his understanding. He may be recording what he's actually perceiving, but he may not be perceiving them even the way he records them the way we do as historians. We can see where... Again, the Journal of A.B. Meek of Alabama. He was a newspaper editor in Tuscaloosa. He put aside the pen and took up the sword. He was elected an ensign in a company of Alabama volunteers that were called out for the Seminole War, and he participated in General Scott's campaign. Meek kept a diary that's interesting read about the operations of the Army in Florida, and probably much as anyone in his regiment he was familiar with the outbreak of the war, having covered in the pages of the Flag of the Union, the newspaper that he edited at the Alabama capital of Tuscaloosa, having covered some of the incidents relative to the outset of the Florida War. He was probably as well informed as anyone about the incidents leading to it. But by the time the campaign ends, his diary trails off. And when he gets home, he really doesn't have much to say in the pages of the newspaper about his military service, other than to reproduce a lengthy description of the Battle of the Nordisassa Creek to counteract the national news and its rather spare and inaccurate discussion of it. But it's pretty obvious that the high-flying rhetoric that Meek was putting in his diary, which would essentially be something you would see in the headlines of a newspaper, that sort of rhetoric dies during the course of his diary while he's actually standing guard duty in the rain and marching through the Florida wilderness. He starts just recording things rather sparely, like Private Winslow died today, buried him in the woods, things of that nature. So earlier in his diary, he's speaking of gathering laurels in the land of flowers, and it's pretty obvious that he has pretty big ideas about the expedition but at the end of it, they didn't see a lot of fighting. Casualties could have been higher, but that regiment, they lost a little more than a dozen men died of disease and wounds. And a lot of men, 25 or so, were wounded in action, and there was a lot of disease. And unfortunately, it's not really compilable, but considering a large number of militia and volunteers that served in the Florida War only served for three months in active federal service, after their discharge, the federal government was no longer responsible for their condition. And we have to look at period newspapers again from around Tuscaloosa to see notices in the following months of men that had served in the campaign that were dying of disease contracted in Florida, for example. But considering they were no longer in U.S. service, they would not be considered a federal casualty of the war. And so you could only try to compile that by going through period local newspapers the extent that they even recorded it. He did write a couple letters during the campaign, but they were mostly very critical of the operations of the Army. He seemed to have ideas that there should have been a great deal more being done, but he doesn't really explain what it is they're supposed to do, especially when they did, prior to the Battle of Thurnacessa Creek, his regiment was halved by disease. 600 men, they could only get three or 400 fit to march. But even those that were fit, many of them were recovering from illness. All of these realities seem to have gotten in the way of Meek's original ideas. And by the time the campaign ends, he doesn't seem at all interested in trying to uh, put a gloss on things, if you get my meaning. He just 
it's puzzling. The first time I read Meek's diary, I thought something's wrong because it's so so full and, and emotive in the beginning and near the end it's just we fought a battle at the Nonasassa Creek. It's literally all that he puts in the diary. And I'm like, What? And then you realize though, I read it the second time and it dawned on me that he he had been disabused of all of his ideas. The editor is now just the soldier. He merely reports that there was a battle and they engaged in it. He did not sign his name to it, but I have no doubt that considering he's the editor of the Flag of the Union newspaper, the lengthy letter describing the battle is of his pen. Meek was known as a man of letters. He did produce later a volume of poetry, Red Eagle, which was relative to the principal Red Stick war chief during the Creek War of 1813. That lengthy epic poem is is well considered, although not popular necessarily. Meek himself has survived popularly in the studies by chess masters and chess enthusiasts. He was an early advocate of semi-professional chess matches. He recorded his chess matches to a certain degree. And you can go online today and Google A.B. Meek chess match, and you can watch illustrated recreations of some of Meek's epic chess matches, although he was not a master by any means. Most of those chess matches seem to show matches which he lost to men that were considered actual masters. It is notable that Meek inserted himself into chess history by having this record of his losses, as it were. (laughs) We'll leave it there. Jesse Marshall? Thanks again for joining us for the Seminole Wars Authority. All right. Well, it was great to talk with you again. You have a great day. This podcast is copyright 2023. The Seminole Wars Foundation. All rights reserved. Find us on the web at seminolewars.podbean.com or seminolewars.us. Front and back bumper music courtesy of the U.S. Navy Band.